I'm going to start with a section of our book that uh, hopefully frames this discussion. Um, it's in a chapter called Cato the Revolutionary. If the defining feature of Cato's afterlife through the time of Dante was a moral debate, the struggle to place him on a spectrum from, of heathen to holy, then the centuries that followed the publication of the Divine Comedy nudged Cato into a different forum. The story of the revolutionary Cato, which began in earnest in the 18th century, was about the man and his politics. It was a debate over secular virtues. Those moments in Cato's life that suggested something divinely inspired were still fiercely debated, but the thinkers of the new era turned more and more to the substance of his public life. His outlook and his behavior is one of Rome's leading witnesses to and shapers of the crisis of the Republic. It remained, as it had always been, a life easily hyperbolized. The secular Cato was still treated as a sacrosanct figure. For the revolutionaries who consciously looked to Republican Rome for models, there was, in the words of historian Gordon Wood, no ancient hero like him. Yet again, Cato was enlarged in death, and he was still moral clay, shaped and reshaped to suit the purpose at hand. The result was a multitude of Catos, each buffed and polished, each carrying a particular message for a particular audience. There was, the Cato, there was Cato the model of civic virtue, Cato the virtuous death, Cato the hero of principled resistance. All were wild, if flattering, exaggerations. They grew from cherry-picked moments of Cato's life and rarely reflected the whole of it. Taken beyond the page, onto canvas and into song, stage, and popular, popular entertainment, Cato became a universal figure, the property of an entire culture. His death was among the best-known parables of the day. Once again, as in the early days of the Roman Principate, his life was taught as a model for schoolboys. On two continents, in a multitude of languages, in a wealth of media, Cato reached the greatest audience he had ever known. So where Rob leaves off is, is Dante making Cato the guardian of purgatory and asking this question that we frankly wanted emblazoned on the back of the book, which was, uh, what earthly man better represents God himself than Cato? Um, what, part of what inspired us as we began writing this was the impact that Cato had on the founding generation. We focused in our preface on the leaders of that generation, George Washington, John Adams, Ben Franklin, who all drew uh, inspiration from Cato and Joseph Addison's play, Cato, uh, A Tragedy in Five Acts. But in some ways, I, I don't want to underestimate the impact that the play had on popular culture in the late 1800s. We weren't able to confirm this, and just because the numbers are a bit sketchy, but this may have been the most popular play in American history until Arthur, Mil Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. Um, it was staged a number of times, was the inspiration for Italian operas. Uh, in England, when it was first written, you actually had, it, you actually had rival Whigs and Tories competing to applaud it more loudly. Uh, the night that it was staged, uh, a Tory, I think it was a Tory, came up to the actor who was playing Cato and pressed 50 guineas into his hand at, for get, offering such a robust depiction of the defense of liberty. Um, it was, it was there, there's virtually no equivalent in some ways in our day. I mean, I, I don't think anything that we have comes close to how popular this play was and the extent of the impact that it had on the founding fathers. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the anecdotes that animated the preface is the, the play at Valley Forge. George Washington is actually taking a risk here in authorizing this play. When we did the research, I think it turns out that a senior officer of Washington's made the suggestion, but that he was such a fan of the play that he almost immediately said yes. This is at a time when plays are actually banned in the colonies. So you are not actually allowed to stage plays, and Washington decides to go ahead and do it anyway. Um, we have very, again, sketchy details of the impact, but we can predict what happened given how well the play was known. Um, we look to the founders the way the founders looked to Cicero and to Caesar and to Cato. They spoke about themselves as latter-day Cicero, Caesars, and, and Catos. Uh, there's a number of moments, uh, particularly in the struggle between Hamilton and Aaron Burr, where they each refer to themselves as Caesar, and Jefferson uses the epithet too, not to lose his place in the history. Um, 
we were moved by this, as I think many of you will be when you, when you read the text. There is this incredible moment at Valley Forge when this play is being staged, and you think to yourself, these are soldiers, these are tired, freezing, hungry men who are discussing you know, a history that preceded them by 1,800 years. Um, the play itself is still staged to this day, and David actually confirmed this. You, you went to a staging of the play um, about two years ago. It's still staged. Here's the problem, and here's why we think it didn't outlast Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. It's a terrible read. <laughs> <laughs> so Addison is commissioned by his particular political party to write a play that they can use as a propaganda piece. He starts it, and he gets four acts through, and he doesn't finish the fifth act. And then he gets a commission to travel Europe to dine with kings and write about politics. So he does that for 14 years. He doesn't finish the play. He comes back, and they say, we really could use the play right now. So he finishes the last act in a week, and it's a total rush job. And he, he doesn't know how it's going to land. It's been kind of a haphazard writing process. But the play is a smashing success. Um, it is, again, it's staged over 200 times in England alone. And the fact is, what he was writing was almost to the extent of what Plutarch was doing, which was a kind of didactic drama. Everything in the play is quotable. There is a reason why the lines from the play were Nathan Hale's last words. There's a reason why Washington peppers his letters with them. It's because it's a play of quotable quotes. But as everybody in this audience probably knows, a play of quotations doesn't particularly make for interesting human interaction. So this play is actually dreadful. I, I would not recommend reading it. We had to read it just to get a flavor of it. But I would not recommend reading it. It's worthwhile for the quotes that it gave to our founders. But the truth is, the play itself is kind of not all that great. Um, so we have this, this amazing play that inspires an Italian opera. It, it inspires song. It inspires poetry. That takes us up through roughly the late 1800s when the play falls out of favor. And we then kind of the, the Cato Trail goes a little bit cold. Um, there's not a lot. I mean, Winston Churchill references Joseph Addison's Cato, but there isn't actually a lot in the late 1800s and early 1900s. We have one moment that I, I want to close on and then discuss a couple of things, which is there is a statue that, is still, that still remains to this day. It's in the northernmost tip of Arlington National Cemetery. It's a 30-foot high statue, and it's a statue to the Confederacy. In the early 1900s, Woodrow Wilson uh, was at the kind of ribbon-cutting ceremony for this statue, and the statue memorializes those who fought for the Confederacy, fought for what they called the lost cause. On the side of the statue, there is a, on the base, one of four sides. One of the four sides is a Latin inscription. And the Latin inscription comes from Lucan. And what's interesting about this inscription is that it has no translation, which means that you know, probably 95 plus percent of the people who have actually visited the statue have no idea what this Latin inscription says. It translates to, the winning cause was pleasing to the gods. The lost cause was pleasing to Cato. And it's a line from Lucan's play that references Cato. It's an amazing thing for us to think about the mark that Cato left on the ground that many of us would consider some of the most sacred acreage in the United States, Arlington National Cemetery. Um, that is really his last mark in name, and really in sort of Latin name, until the creation of the Cato Institute. Um, we were really privileged to have David kind of sanction this book, not sanction it, but at least uh, approve of our pursuing it early on. Uh, we, we thought that there were resonances to modern day politics, which we can get into. But I think the points that Rob touched upon about how Cato practiced politics, how he lived his life, are still relevant, just as his legacy is still relevant for us.